he thinks his dad knew that the programs were a means to an end, which the end being money. And he says that, you know, he feels very guilty that realizing that the vacation funds of his childhood were coming from abuse, torture, and death of other of other kids. He didn't know when he was a kid. How would he? And he, the last thing he says is like, they used to call Robert's compound the millionaire's junkyard. That is so fucked up. It's fucked up. Boom, 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 so fucked up. Boom, 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 boom. It is just so damn fucked up. That's fucked up. Can't believe a whole day has elapsed. I feel like it's only been a matter of moments since we spoke. I know, <laughs> right? Just kidding, you guys. To be real, um, it's the same day. It's Saturday, and we just recorded the second episode, and we had a little snack a doodle, and we're back for episode three. And I don't know about you guys, but we are ready to get in. And I will tell you everything that you're going to tell me at the, we're going to do something unusual. Let me say that first. We don't typically split episodes down the middle. Whoa. So this is a first no. for us. And I haven't listened to anything you're going to talk about. I stopped watching. So it will be brand new to me. And I'm excited to hear how it ends. <gasps> oh, shit. Okay. Okay. Well, I've seen the whole thing. And I have now seen the first episode and the second half of the last episode twice. But I will hear it from you. So I'm deeply entrenched in this at this point. What are we talking about today? <gasps> well, um, you guys, this is a podcast. Dare I say <laughs> a comedy podcast about cults and crime and other stuff that makes you say, ugh, that's so fucked up, whether you're crying or laughing or you're saying it with disgust. We are here to talk about that. And this is, did I say this is not so fucked up? No. Whatever. That's the name of the show. <laughs> and we're your hosts. <laughs> I'm, I'm Ashley Fallon. Love Richards. <laughs> I'm Fallon Maury. I know who I am. I was going to say just this episode, well, this whole series, heavy emphasis on the, ugh, that's so fucked up. Ugh. I've just I feel like most of my responses when you're talking are just a series of like grunts and groans and like sighs. it's okay you're just doing to me what I used to do to you which is like react visually but not verbally <laughs> be like no it's horrifying I just don't know what to say about this when it's so fucked up uh, yeah I'm at a loss for words so let's get into it you guys this is part three Again, we are talking about the program, Cons, Kidnapping, and Cults. It's a three-part docuseries currently on Netflix. It's the best expose of the troubled teen industry that I've seen. It's directed by Katherine Kubler. She did an amazing job. Friend of the show, Dr. Yanya Lalik, is featured quite a bit. She is always brings just incredibly kind and insightful, really important things right. to know to the table. And, you know, please listen to the first two episodes because they are out now. And, you know, you really need to have the foundation laid before you hear this last episode episode three, follow the money because now this last episode is kind of where we're tying up the loose yep. ends from the first couple episodes where honestly so much happened I didn't even know how to like recap it. I think I could do a little recap. So episode two and it's okay that there's not much to say at some points because I think Catherine did such a beautiful job of bringing out every point that needed to be made about this industry and so sometimes there's nothing more to say than like Ugh, or wow, because it's just so well done. But episode two was, if you go back and watch it, it was called Mind Control. And it was really just all about digging into the parts of what happened at Ivy Ridge from how they worked on controlling the minds of the, I'm not going to call them students, the victims, 
to how they worked on controlling the minds of the parents. And I think that's pretty much a summary of where we are now. Yeah. Good job. And in the first one, you know, we met a lot of the survivors, most of them who were sent away at like between 13 and 16 years old and spent anywhere from eight to three and a half years at this fucking place. Um, We see the old school that they've abandoned all the files and evidence, which is super wild. We hear Catherine's story. We learn all about the conditions at Ivy Ridge. You guys just definitely need to check that out first. At least check out our episode first. We definitely highly, highly, highly recommend the documentary, but with a huge trigger warning attached to that. I mean, huge trigger warning attached to all of these episodes. It's really hard stuff to hear. But as you know, here on TSFU, in a way that's always respectful to victims, we do talk about things with a bit of a humorous spin. So we can talk about them, like literally, so we have the ability to do it. I think our goal here isn't to take anything from the documentary. I want everyone to watch this documentary. I almost never post stuff like this on my social media. And yesterday I posted a giant thing with a link to it. We here want to like amplify the voice of the documentary if we can in any small way. Just go watch it. But trigger warning, like we said. I would say that, you know, definitely if you don't feel that you're up to watching it, then listening to this episode and educating yourself that way is just as valuable. It's just really important that these survivors have their stories heard and fucking believed because that is most of what they've been And the episode starts right out with that. They start by saying that essentially when they got all these survivors got out of the program, the program didn't want them to find each other. They had to resort to what was popular at the time, which was MySpace. So the program right away was like, "Uh, let's see if we can keep them apart from each other. And not only that, they knew that the program was tracking them. Like, how fucking scary is that? Like I said, horror movie, especially in the last episode when you (sighs) described one of the survivors getting let out and then taken back after a few months that is literally one of my worst nightmares you know sometimes you see in fucking like horror movies where somebody gets away from the killer and then they get taken back and it's like no that's literally so much worse it doesn't feel like it could happen in real life Not that anybody's story is worse here. It's just like, oh, my God, to taste freedom and like think you might be okay, And then it's oh, my heart goes out to everybody who's ever, you know, been within arms fucking length of one of these places. Yeah, exactly. So the the students kind of knew the program was tracking them. But as adults, the survivors present Tom Nichols, who is the guy they went to visit. He was the PR director for a while. He now is a pastor at a church, you know, spreading that good love to people and teaching them mm. right from wrong. Question mark. Uh, they present him what? with an email he wrote at the time. They say, so are you going to admit that you were tracking us when we left? And he's like, we would have never been allowed to track you. That would have been so illegal. We would have been fired. And they're like, really? Because do you want to step outside the church so you don't lie in a church? Because here's an email that you wrote saying that we should track the kids quietly and make sure no one's going to be close to filing a lawsuit and that see who might be close to like going off the rails again and ready to come back. And uh, that's your signature at the bottom. This is your email and then he just sort of was like bro i mean i'm sure people in his congregation have netflix don't you think i hope so i feel like people are getting calm down settle down whatever we'll talk i'll I'll say that till the end Ah, okay Catherine talks about first about the process of waking up, what she calls waking up. It's the process of undoing their brainwashing. People in uh, usually breaking away from 
spiritual abuse called deconstructing. People have their different terms for kind of uh, disbanding these ridiculous fucking beliefs that are just so goddamn untrue. It's insane that have been jammed into their heads. Right. I kind of love the term waking up because instead of what was done to them was sort of like deconstructing their own senses of self. So I feel like there's more agency in the term of like waking Mm -hmm. up. I'm not pulling myself apart again. I'm waking up to the truth, which I love it as a term. She actually goes and talks to Maya who wrote the book help at any cost. And she kind of says like, how did you get into talking about this? Like her book was the number one book that Catherine went to when she was starting this sort of like undoing process. And Maya said she had heard about this industry and she was so curious, like who came up with this terrible idea? How did they come up with it? How did they do it? And um, she started looking for places to get evidence about it. And Catherine says like, it's pretty crazy that the program she was in was the one that left all the evidence behind, like all of the TTI places. Yeah, what? No, that's that is a pretty, pretty fucking wild coinky dink. So uh, the adult survivors look at old records again and they're looking for costs and evidence of like how much people paid into this program they find a check that says one parent is signing an agreement of like three thousand dollars for a three-month contract i think that means three thousand per month oh yeah definitely that's on the very low end too Yeah, because Catherine then says she found records that her dad paid $5,085 a month. And when you multiply that across 15 months, that means that he paid, the way she phrases it, so he paid $76,000 essentially to give her PTSD. Which Yanya corrects her later and says, see PTSD, actually. And we'll define that. It's crazy how the documentary touches on so many important apropos things. What is interesting, and as we're going to kind of unpack here, is that very little of that money is actually going into Ivy Ridge. And in the town that Ivy Ridge was located is called Ogdensburg, and it is a very poor, economically distressed town. And it was at the time Ivy Ridge was built. Um, You see shots of it and like all the houses and buildings are very like kind of broken down and, and in disrepair. But there is essentially a school or a a, a, ho- a mental hospital, a prison, and Ivy Ridge. And the main economy of Ogdensburg is institutionalization of some type. That is so intense, dude. I feel like the town got used when you hear about like how they operated. Yeah. So Sean, who we met in the previous documentary, he was sent away when he was 15. He said like walking around Ogdensburg, he feels bad to see the suffering. Like he wants to feel more empathetic toward like the people who lived in that town. But so many of them were part of what was going on at Ivy Ridge because Ivy Ridge was basically feeding the whole economy. They interview a woman named Brandy and Brandy says like, you know, there's not a lot here. I needed a job. So they came here and they were offering jobs to people. And a friend asked me to come to the academy where she worked. And she said, "Okay, well, all I have to do is just sit in a hallway. Right. No big deal. I can just sit in a hallway. Oh, that's all. Yeah. No biggie. At the academy, which is a pretty hilarious term. She realized, though, when she got there that there was more to it. She was watching kids going to bed alone at night. No parents, nobody who loved them. She tried to follow the rules they gave her, but without breaking her morals. And she said she couldn't do it because she thought that they were being treated like prisoners. And she says, you know, I think I could have done better. Maybe I should have done more when I left. The kids deserved better. And she left after one month. But the thing was... Ivy Ridge was the biggest employer in the area. And so nobody who lived there wanted to complain because if Ivy Ridge leaves, the economy is destroyed. And that's a lot to put on people like you either have to support childhood victimization. It's another bounded choice thing, in my opinion. You support child victimization or turn an eye to it or you and your family potentially like live in a town where you starve to death. It's not a fair choice. For them either. No, it's really 
fucked just they all interview around. this woman who sounds like an absolute awful person and this woman says they don't identify her by name and they don't show her but she says like yeah I, i'll admit it i was a bitch i needed to follow the rules that they gave me to a t because i needed a job and she says there were zero qualifications to work there there was no background check and no training. What she was told was that if the students are complaining and if you're being mean, then you're doing a good job. So many of these people are so fucking shameless. It's wild. Which it's funny because her statement here kind of reminds me of, you know, when you say like, otherwise, OK, people do bad things. So this reminds me of when we talked about like Stanford prison and they like took all the guards aside and said, if you're being mean and you're like making their lives hell, like that's what we want. That's essentially what she was told. Get in there and be mean. Oh, the fuck. Fucking... And that comes from the top. Right. That's that's what they're pushing people to do. The line between victim and perpetrator just becomes so fucking blurry sometimes it makes my head spin like oh hello i need glasses i don't and what's essentially going on. like the the people in this community didn't know the kids but what they were told in advance of the kids coming when they first opened the school was okay these kids are the worst of the worst they're on their way to jail or juvenile detention they're into hard drugs they're super disrespectful they deserve harsh treatment and so these people are being primed to think that these kids are like hardened criminals already. Like they don't know that they're just kids whose parents ship them off there. So when they go in, that's how they're primed to treat them. Maya says essentially what they did was they dehumanized the kids. And so the staff thought they were doing the right thing by being cruel to the kids. And what this resulted in was a bunch of people who are not used to having power now having a ton of power and being on a massive power trip, which can change their behavior as well, a.k.a. Stanford Prison Experiment. <laughs> Y'all, if you haven't listened to that episode yet, you need to. And ooh, ooh, I check the show notes. I know a lot of you don't read them, which, look, I do put effort into them, but it's fine. But I'm going to link all of our episodes about the troubled teen industry as well as the episodes that are linked to each of these three that are together. And the episode on Stanford Prison Experiment? Yes. Yes. That one and probably the Milgram Experiment too, because they also compare that one. And it is a very interesting study on um, people's, you know, what they do yeah. under the right situation and authoritarian person this is such an interesting real world study of that yeah yeah this is fucking this is stanford prison experiment because as you go upper level too you become more right. of the enforcer so it's very stanford prison the documentary shows um a clip from ken k who was the president of the worldwide association of special programs or wasp um, which is the overarching company that owns this and or manages this and a number of other similar properties. And he says that when they get accused of abusing or being cruel to kids, it's just not true. Oh, that, that explains it. Thanks, Ken. Let's clear that right up for us. I'm sorry. You know what I was just I'm just Ken. <laughs> No, you know what Billy Madison, when Steve Buscemi, Buscemi? Buscemi, Buscemi, how do you say his last name? Buscemi. Like Billy calls him and apologizes for bullying him. And he like marks Billy off of his <laughs> shit list and then puts <laughs> lipstick on. I am literally imagining like sitting there like Steve Buscemi, just like having a fucking like just having a list of these people and just like crossing it off as shit happens to them and i think i just thought of a really good tiktok thing actually i'm gonna do that this is so awful that it it's like kind of comical this man let me let this sink in this man is the president of a supposed system of schools teaching dangerous uh -huh. behavior modification techniques his most recent job before becoming el presidente 
is the nighttime security guard at a hospital. Right. Um, well, it was a hospital for juveniles, right? right? Like a psychiatric hospital for juveniles. He was the, yeah, like the night guard. Yeah, he tried to say, they were like, so you were the night guard. And he's like, that's not exactly what I'd call it. I'd call it more like a night watchman position. Like, Yeah, he chuckles as if like, I didn't have that much responsibility. <laughs> that is like me saying, well, I worked at a Toys R Us once, so I'm capable of being the secretary of education. Like, come on. Yeah. <laughs> Same thing, basically. So this the system is charging a ton of money based on the claims of turning around 15,000 kids already to better behavior. And parents are thinking they're paying a ton of money to very well-educated staff. And Maya points out that if you are a program providing good psychiatric care, you're not going to make a lot of money because it is incredibly hard to get a full staff of like a fully trained staff and you have to pay them a lot. Right. Everybody is going to have to have master's degrees right. and shit if it's child psychology that's not a oh, not cheap at all. staff to pay. That's very specialized care. And these places, though, are convincing parents that they don't necessarily need all those qualifications because the program is so well created that any staff can just walk in and follow the program, right? Yeah, it's like so simple. Just give us your child who's so complex that you can't even figure them out and we just will make it super simple. Catherine and the other survivors look at some documents and see that they were only paying some staff as little as five fifty an hour to take care of these kids. And if you do a little math, that facility alone, so Ivy Ridge alone, was bringing in about one point five million dollars a month from the kids who were there. They were spending about four dollars a day per kid on meals, times like five hundred kids total. And they were using mostly all free child labor. The kids were doing all cleaning, all cooking. They said there was no janitorial staff. They were doing it all. <laughs> yeah, that's like in hell camp. They're like, oh, send your kid to our facility in Samoa. And then lo and behold, there is no facility in Samoa. And the kids are there right. to build it. Like the kids are there. It's like a detention camp. Yeah. That is the facility, is them building a facility. And essentially what they're doing is they're eliminating everything that makes operating a school expensive and then just calling it something fancier than it is, a therapeutic boarding school. The entire concept is a scam. It sounds very fancy, therapeutic boarding school. Anything therapeutic sounds fancy. If you put therapeutic in front of like massage, it like makes it $100 more expensive. Therapeutic right. horse riding. Instead of $20, it's $300. Right. It's like when you put yeah. gluten free in front of something, it becomes $5 more expensive. Like gluten free water is $5 more expensive than regular water. I don't know, but like it's the same concept. Just fancy it up. Yeah. So Catherine talks to a man named John Sullivan. He was a director at the New York State Attorney's Office. He says that the school had 500 students, 240 staff, and only one qualified teacher. And is that the person that they would get five minutes with Probably. if they raised their hand? But he calls out that they used a homeschool Bible-based program called Switched On Schoolhouse, which I don't know if you remember from any of our like talks with people over like evangelical stuff, but switched on is like another one of those terms they talk about when someone's like super excited about their faith, like, oh, they're switched on. So we flash over to a news report and it's somebody reporting about Ivy Ridge saying the school is not certified and they're handing out essentially bogus diplomas. And John Sullivan's office, the New York attorney's office, had started investigating and realized that they could show that the school was a complete fraud. And Ivy Ridge was made to refund a million dollars. They don't say to who, whether it was the state or actual families. There's just a, a news clipping. And 
it was the largest educational fraud case in New York State until Trump University came along. I had to look up <laughs> what Trump University was. Y'all, he fucking started a, quote, university where you could get everything up to a fucking doctorate. And then they found out that they were, like, encouraging the salespeople to sell the elite package and actually like no fucking education worth shit was going on and he defrauded like everybody who signed yes. up and, and then we were like let's make a president anyways so weird. what i don't what? know what just happened <laughs> he points out and this makes me really sad that new york state had more regulations governing dog kennels than governing troubled teen programs which is bananas <sighs> so Catherine says can anyone who left Ivy Ridge and graduated actually say they have a legitimate high school diploma? And he says, no. So any child whose parents left them there through high school graduation is a useless high school diploma. And he says they might as well have dressed up like bunnies and handed each other carrots instead of graduation diplomas. <laughs> <laughs> Like, that's how absolutely fucking meaningless yeah. that ceremony Catherine was. Catherine says she was luckily able to get her dad's help to get, like, a homeschool diploma. And then she got accepted to a four-year college in L.A. for film creation. But most kids were not so lucky. They go back and talk to Sean. And he doesn't even have his diploma anymore. But he says he didn't realize until he wanted to go apply to college that he had no high school diploma that counted. And now he felt really stupid and slighted because he had to go get a GED and there's nothing wrong with a GED but this kid thought he put up with all this crap and got a high school diploma and he was shocked to find out it meant nothing it's not your fault Sean don't feel stupid nobody's it's nobody's fault it's I heard more than one survivor say during the documentary oh I feel so stupid for falling for this or whatever and just like the survivor guilt is like so and unreal this makes me sad he said growing up they show pictures of him as like an adorable little boy in like a sandbox and he says growing up he wanted to excel he wanted to chase his dreams he wanted to go after educational and athletic pursuits and he completely lost his chance he also never became the fixed son that his parents were looking for. And after the program, there was a huge family disconnection. Every time his mom saw him, she cried and apologized to him when he visited. And they could never get past that like constant apology brokenness. And he said what he regrets is that um, before his mom passed away, what he regrets more than anything is his mom never got her kid back, which is so sad. Bro, I can't. And I think he said something too, or maybe I made it up and it was in my head, <laughs> um, but about how she would apologize and he would say, it's okay, but it he knew that yes, it wasn't okay. He would essentially okay. like, just do it for her. Which shows a lot about his character that he is able to like care enough about her still to say it's okay to make her feel better, even knowing. Yes, and mm -hmm. to, you know, play the um, improv artist here. I think that's a really common thing that survivors of childhood mm -hmm. trauma do um like you know my mom is a narcissist so instead of getting like abused and having my needs neglected and whatnot by like a staff of people that she paid she just like did it for free and uh she is really really good at saying sorry like, hence why I fucking hate verbal apologies. I'm like, suck a <laughs> dick. Like, do something. <laughs> I don't care. But so it's, I think, a really common trauma response for when you have this parent or this caretaker who's like, I'm really sorry. You feel guilty that they obviously feel guilty. So your response is to be like, yeah. it's okay. Because for the longest time, I would say it's okay to my mom when she would apologize. And I was like, it's not fucking okay. Who are you saying that for? And I was like, you bitch. And then. Yeah. 
Intense stuff. Heck mm. yeah. Yeah, it's so fucked. I just don't even know what to say anymore except that's so fucked up. No, I know. Yeah. We have to do something lighter after this. For the love of God, just give us classic murder or something. Just give it to us as if we don't yeah. make the schedule. <laughs> They show Ken K again, and he's saying the nice thing about America is that we can create programs like this where we can help our troubled youth. God bless America. Oh, God bless America. Where you have the freedom to take away the freedom of children. Yep. God bless the USA. Amen. Yes. John Sullivan says that while they were doing the review of their educational like qualifications for their investigation, they were not empowered to conduct an abuse review. But the fraud case exposed the program and how bogus it was. And so over a few years, Ivy Ridge enrollment declined to the point where the school had to close its doors and, you know, shut down. You know what drives me cuckoo bananas? The, uh, quote, justice right. system. What's going on there? They're like, we can't investigate the literal thousands of abuse allegations. What? She's like, well, how can a system like this that abuses so many kids and like defraud people get away with this over and over? And he says, well, the way to do that is just follow that money. I'm sorry, you've been listening forever. Have I not always say it goes all yes. the way to the top? And follow the money. What's at the top money? <laughs> I mean, Fallon. <laughs> <laughs> What's at the top money? I was like, she was really excited to answer that question. She didn't think I was going to get it. Fallon's extremely slow. And money. And money. Follow the money to the fucking top because it always goes all the way to the top. I'm nowhere near the top. Oh, well, this is going there. Uh, Catherine goes to Montana and she interviews a woman named, I hope I say her last name right, Anne Motory. And she is an attorney that sued Wasp. In 2005, Anne's firm got a case about a death at one of their programs. And she said for two years, she dedicated about 90% of her practice to that case. And they show a video of her office. It's like two bookshelves and like, the entire floor of a room covered in binders about this investigation. Oh, and what did you say, Fallon? That it's super rare that deaths happen? No. At I didn't these say places? It's super rare. Okay, no, that's right. Because it's not, because it's super fucking very not uncommon. Kids die. And if anyone listening places. is at all fucking doubting, it's happened twice this year that we have publicly been made aware about. It's March 9th right now while we're recording this so so the one she was suing was called spring creek lodge and she quickly realized the expansive nature of the schools in this program and so she was like okay i have to review every program with in the wasp umbrella including ivy ridge what she quickly discovered was that the programs all entered into numerous contracts with out of state companies and llc's and these these all these different extra companies they worked with took a third of the earnings off of the top of the student tuition that came in and found that there were 73 different companies associated with Wasp. And she wanted to know who was profiting. Really quick. Throw my business out real quick. And let a woman explain something in case you guys didn't know. An LLC is a limited liability corporation, meaning I can't really explain further, but I do know what the acronym means. But it obviously means that that corporation has limited liability. So it's like, oh, what are you guys doing? Oh, I don't know. We were doing it right. with them. And My company is like just does this very singular function. And I actually work for this other company. And this other company is owned by that company. And that company is part of that company. And so as she's going through, she's compiling these like charts and tables of like figuring out how they all connect. And ultimately, if you look into all these other companies, most of them are located in Utah, and one name keeps coming up, which is a man by the name of Robert Litchfield, who happens to be the owner and operator of Wasp. Satan Litchfield. Yes, that's his 
commonly given name. <sighs> Listen, you guys, I might or might not have his <laughs> phone number. It's, people are findable on the internet. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. Allegedly. I'm trying to keep going to keep you out of legal trouble. So Robert Litchfield <laughs> <laughs> was part of a huge Mormon family that grew up in pretty much in poverty. One of his first jobs was working at Provo Canyon School, which is another troubled teen industry location, I think since closed. Get the shit tit out of here. This guy's a Mormon? Who'd a uh, thunk it? And when they looked into his behavior at the school, they found him as like super dictatorial, like a real hard ass, super unpleasant guy. Real quick, just for those of you who are like, oh, Provo Canyon, that sounds slightly familiar. That's where one of the, I think four, my God, um, facilities that Paris Hilton was sent to. That's why it's probably familiar. And after working there for a pretty short time, he ventured out on his own and opened his very own school to torture children called Cross Creek Manor. What he would do was, I think he was working with a hospital called Brightway, which was an adolescent hospital. Wait, Brightway? That sounds familiar. Get out of here. He funneled people who were having issues due to no fault of their own into a school to abuse them for those issues and hired the nighttime security guard at that hospital to be the public face and president of his newly formed company or organization wasp. How about that? I'm also going to let you keep going to keep me out of legal <laughs> so trouble. Please proceed Fallon. Y'all should have seen the most dangerous look I've ever seen on Ashley's face just now. It, I, I don't, that's the face somebody wears right before doing something that lands them in prison. <laughs> and then I and then I took a a terrifying moment to compose myself and <laughs> continue. Robert has always evaded responsibility for abuse, fraud. He has had numerous schools closed due to issues with the abuse of children and complaints and financial scams, and yet. He has never been held personally responsible. And that's why he sets up the corporations that he does because he is able to be like, it's not, I don't own them. They're owned by 73 other companies. I just happen to have a stake in every one of those companies. I hate him as much as Marilyn Manson. Wow. That's a BFD, guys. That's real talk. So his way of like evading responsibility for what happens is he will say there's no such thing as physical punishment it's called physical restraint that we use and that never kills kids or people like george floyd exactly he will claim that he doesn't police the programs at these locations he is a distant role he's just like part owner he doesn't he just like checks in on him like he yeah. doesn't know what goes on and the lawyer who was suing them said, if you dig in, you can see from factual evidence that he's everywhere. He's the one who approves staff member bonuses, bonuses for recruiting more kids, who the directors of each center are. He does media consulting. He, his fingers are all through these schools. He knew kids were being held in seclusion for days at a time. And this is the one that I have to pause a second. He doesn't even refer to the children as children. In his correspondence, he calls them units. Sorry, BRB. I'm just going to fucking barf <laughs> on everything. Like, I'm so mad. My eyebrows have been somewhere like just at the top of my forehead in disbelief for uh, hours. You guys, by the way, let us know because we stopped doing um, YouTube. If that's something um, video is something that you would like to see on the Patreon, let us know. Hit us up on Instagram at TSFU. I've been the playing podcast. with my emotional support elephant mini stuffed animal the whole time I've been talking. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. I've where's, been, your where's my pickle? He referred to his company as a McDonald's franchise, essentially. So Wasp provides like the backbone of these places. It provides media relations, seminars. It's the governing body. As a result, Wasp, the organization, gets $75 per kid per month for any child in any of their schools worldwide. And they show the balance sheet for one month. 
of all the school totals added up and the wasp company is taking eight million dollars a month from the children being in these schools eight million a month keep listening (laughs) so Catherine facetimes a cross creek survivor that that was the first school he opened who kind of gives her a little tour while she's in cross creek and the the stop by um this room that was used for solitary confinement and you see that the room it's like the normal height of a room but the room is maybe five by six like Catherine sits in the middle of the room and is like whoa this is small and like i think if she laid down she'd be touching either of the walls and the person she's on the phone with said kids could be locked in that room for months months they have less rights than like you said dogs yes than incarcerated Mm -hmm. people adults Catherine notes that kids who were really resistant to the programs were sent to a place called High Impact in Tecate, Mexico, where they were forced to walk outdoors for hours in dog cages, walk laps out in the sun. And let's remember, Mexico is generally like pretty fucking hot. And in the picture or the video footage, it looks so. It's not a place with shade. It's like an open, barren, non-shaded walkway. Mm-hmm. Just uh, in caged dirt in in the beating hot sun that they're walking around in circles. I'm sure they make sure that everybody has sunscreen on and good shoes that are good for their bodies. Oh, I'm sure. Totally. Yeah. My eyes are rolling. It, nobody can see that. <laughs> So Anne shows Catherine pictures of some of the facilities at Spring Creek where she was investigating. There's a tiny shack called The Hobbit, which is like this teeny tiny little shack that they would keep kids in for days at a time when they weren't listening. It has no temperature controls and kids were allowed to shower every four days. At least they gave it a cute name, though. That makes it worse. Okay. I'm just like, sorry, I keep joking so much because it's like I can't. I was just viscerally reacting to the whole thing. The classroom that she shows where the kids had to sit all day, every day is literally like pieces of plywood stuck together vertically to make little like cubicle walls with a plank of wood between. And the kids sat on a a wooden box, literal wooden boxes and wooden planks for desks, not with like a, a pad on it or a back, just a sharp edged wooden box, unfinished wooden box it was like how can i spend the absolute little most and money this is as possible what, what the most insidious part is is all of this every single thing that's being done to these children is all in service of perpetuating something to make one man rich why has he not been charged yet um Anne says it's such a sophisticated setup like i said before they can shift blame through all these LLCs so no one can ever actually be blamed. A man named Jay Atkin advised Litchfield. He, this man was the founder of SkyWest Airlines and he co-owned one of the first WASP programs that was set up. So he helped Litchfield to set up and explain to him like set up through a series of LLCs and essentially it helps you evade responsibility. Litchfield's own sister swore in an affidavit that when she asked him, why do you need so many accounts? He sort of cornered her and was like, "Uh, you need to keep your mouth shut. And at the bottom, they didn't highlight it in the documentary or read it, but you can see at the bottom of the document that she said he moved like he was going to strike her. So he's like physically threatening her and telling her to shut her mouth. That's not terrifying. You're not doing that if you know that your business is above board. Just saying. There's a quote of him saying that when you're the best in the business, you're under so much scrutiny compared to everybody else. When you're the best at torturing kids, it's like (laughs) a lot. It's hard to do us, guys. It's so much, you guys. And then they introduce this man called Narvin Litchfield. And who blocked me on Instagram. Narvin, not Marvin. Narvin Litchfield is the weak link in his family. He owns and directs multiple troubled teen programs. Robert used him to help build some of the programs up, but many of his programs have been since 
shut down. Thomas Houlihan, who we heard from way back in the first episode, he's a journalist. He researched this man and says, I think you called this out in the first episode, the abuse of a child is the business of anybody who knows about it. And he, oh my God. Yeah. And so he's going over the like giant, you know, the giant wall with the pins and the, the lines between the pictures, like the, what's the full Charlie Pepe Silva, the murder board board. or whatever crime board. And yeah, Catherine's with him and she's like pointing at different people like Jason Finlinson, who is, I think their academic director. And she's like, like this guy, how did he get in? And they're like, Oh, well he married May. Maybeth Litchfield. He married one of the Litchfields. So that's how he gets his in. All in the family. Somebody at some point goes on to one of the WASP survivor groups on Facebook, and his name is Nathaniel Litchfield. And he reaches out and says, I'm here to help if anyone wants to talk. I understand what you're going through, and I, I'm happy to meet with you if you want to meet with me. And he is the son of Narvin Litchfield. He cut off his dad. It was a combination of things. He said, you know, he felt like he made a lot of excuses for him over the years, but he ultimately felt really guilty and that his family destroyed lives. And she said, how do you describe your dad? And he's like, as an asshole, (laughs) but basically a man who wears two faces. He could be a funny guy, but then he also has a super dark side. He saw himself, not surprisingly, as a biblical scholar because they always do. What? Get out. Get out. When he was a child, his understanding of Wasp was like some place where his dad said they were doing God's work. And after Robert Litchfield got the ball rolling, he sort of became the provider of the whole family by starting Wasp. Narvin used to be a used car salesman. So his son is like, he has no problem lying to people's faces and selling shitty things, basically. He eventually took over the marketing and admissions arm of the Cross Creek School. Um, Money started to flow in when he was like five or six. And interestingly enough, Narvin pioneered sort of like early search engine optimization. So people would end up when they would type, you know, how do I fix my kid into Google? They would get directed to a WASP program site above all others. Yeah, that's that's so fucked up. So at some point, the family moved to South Carolina to open up what was called the Carolina Springs Academy because Narvin said God had come to him and said we need to open a new school because it's always God. God's always telling men to do wild shit, you know. He also said God told him to open a school in Costa Rica named Dundee, like Crocodile Dundee. This school was rated after 16 months. And as they're raiding the school, kids are fleeing into the jungle and other kids start trashing it. And like nobody saw this on the news and goes, wait, they they went to a school and kids fled into the literal <sighs> thing jungle to get away. <laughs> no, it's like, you know, this has been brought to the attention of the media and shit more than once it's i really hope this documentary is the thing that like really creates some change after dundee gets shut down narvin changes the name to pillars of hope seven months later but he says it in spanish so i guess it's legit he says (laughs) they show narvin in a video saying here we treat our children like my own nathaniel says god fucking forbid he treats anyone like his own children because he treated us like shit Yeah, which gave me like a lot of empathy for his kids, you know, dealing with this fucking this type of monster of a person. Well, he sent Nathaniel to one of his programs um, at 17 years old. So he enrolled his kid in it to look legit. And Nathaniel's like, yeah, I was enrolled, but I wasn't getting the same degree of treatment that the other kids were getting. But then they transferred me out after a few months. I went to the school called Gulf Coast, which he said was an absolute disarray. He walked in the first day and the principal said to him, fuck your dad. You're now the new principal and like handed him a binder and left. And so he's like 18 and is now the principal of a school (sighs) with no qualifications. He realized as he's like looking at what's going on and in his 20s, like he got away from the chaos of his family and everything going on and realized what huge problems there were. He thinks his dad knew that the programs were a means to an end, which the end being money. And he says that, you know, he feels very guilty that realizing that the 
vacation funds of his childhood were coming from abuse, torture, and death of other kids. He didn't know when he was a kid. How would he? The last thing he says is like, they used to call Robert's compound the millionaire's junkyard because that's where people's money went to die. Robert has since sold the property and moved on to owning different properties, but I guess his nephew lives there to run a program that targets disabled teens. And that's where I stopped watching, which is probably better because this is the part I would have like lost my shit at, I'm guessing. So yeah, it's called the Millionaire's Junkyard because it's this like insane estate that Fallon described earlier. There's like a whole fucking lake and there's multiple guest houses and there's <laughs> there's ostriches and there's like a probably a golf course i don't even know it's insane it's now been taken over by his nephew tyler olson who is now running it as a <gasps> what a new facility called solagria which targets mentally challenged young adults so not i i, I want to point out that not just disabled but literally their target is children's families who don't want to deal with the fact that they have mental challenges not a lot fucking surprises me but this yeah throwback to like 1950 where after if you had like a child with down syndrome or other mental like mental disability they would have you send them off and never live with their family again like to a sanitarium like that level yeah this is what they're going for yeah that's a that's their target audience at solagria so tyler olson is a stupid fucking dick bag who was previously a teen transporter aka kidnapper oh so the guys with the handcuffs yeah yeah middle of the night on a facebook picture he's like doing a selfie in front of like some fancy car and it says sometimes we get to go kidnapping in luxury lol and kidnapping and luxury are both misspelled just to i'm add so insult to agitated right now that i'm like pulling at the skin on my own lips while i'm trying to talk this yeah watch out don't you know Leave some skin for your poor lips. <laughs> uh, so as we've been saying, you know, Robert Litchfield has set things up in a way that he has no liability and has never been held to any account, which makes me want to punch through every wall in my house. He's never spent a day in jail. This is super weird. We were talking about like money going all the way to the top and stuff so um litchfield's companies and his family's companies and associated companies have actually been donating to political campaigns for um <gasps> mostly republicans I, was, i'm shocked <laughs> no i know it's um since 2001 oh. and in a 12-month period, the companies had given $175,000 in political donations. Weirdly, uh, you know, papers later reported that Utah family calls in <gasps> political favors. They do. No shit. Yeah, fun fact, Robert Litchfield was Mitt Romney's utah financial co-chair and helped him raise tons of money oh interesting because a bunch of people involved in amway were like finance co-chairs and fin and like members of the the same party and like got all these laws passed oh, weird. that directly benefited them wild so wild that is so what a coincidence right it just like never happens that often i wish i had money I know it's really weird when you like have money and then you get things and then how when you don't, you don't. I don't know why, but that made me hungry. <laughs> I was like, mm, you get things like snacks sometimes, snacks. snackies. <sighs> My mind's just like, let's think about other stuff. ADHD for the win. Okay, here we go. Boom. Keep going. In 2003, Congressman George Miller started investigating all of this fucking 
shenanigans, and his harshest criticisms went towards Wass. He asked the government to look into the issue. Weirdly, they ignored it. They're like, child abuse, who gives a hoot? Then, five years later, in 2008, there were actually congressional hearings regarding thousands of cases of neglect and abuse in these facilities between 1990 and 2007. <sighs> you guys, sorry, Fallon, you you guys just like literally skip ahead 30 seconds because the next thing I'm about to tell you is really fucking intense. They describe what is done to children in some instances in these places, including forcing youth to eat their own vomit, being denied adequate food, being forced to lie in urine or feces, being kicked, beaten, and thrown to the ground, and forced to clean toilets with toothbrushes and then use those toothbrushes to brush their teeth. Essentially, they get away with pretty much everything besides waterboarding. That's in addition, obviously, to all of the sexual, emotional, psychological, and mental abuse that we've already discussed. Sorry to have Fallon, I know. Ugh. I'm just not talking. I'm just sitting here with my hand over my mouth, like trying to get through it. Yeah, we're just going to keep trucking. The hearings happened and turned up an insane amount of very disturbing evidence like we just talked about and nothing happened. I cannot imagine being a survivor of of, the, of these fucking programs and having people be like, your story isn't true. It doesn't matter. And we're going to keep doing it, even though we heard <sighs> what's going on. Like that has to be one of the hardest fucking parts. So Caroline Cole, who was sent away at 14 and spent 29 oh months. In programs. That's um, almost three years, two and a half years, starting at the age of 14. Uh, she was Ivy Ridge with Catherine and has been heavily involved in advocacy. After tons of bad publicity, WASP closed their doors. But like all good TTI facilities and corporations, it's like whack-a-mole and they just popped up in new places under new names. Currently... A1 Eagle Ranch Academy, very official sounding. You guys, if you can't like smell the name of a TTI by now, just like, come on. They have this like nice sounding name that you like, you're like oh, there's something nefarious happening. Eagle Ranch Academy is now operating out of, wait, we've heard of this one, the Brightway facility oh in St. George, where um used to be the night boy, security guard. First. Yeah. Yeah. Whoa, security guard. <laughs> oh, whoa. whoa. <laughs> he was. I was more like a night watch person. He was like a, a night guy. You know, I was like, I wouldn't say that I was like officially yeah. guarding things. <laughs> Settle down, Fallon. And this was pretty wild. Catherine and some of the other survivors find stuff at the hotel that they're staying at from a parent seminar. It's like, nothing happens by accident. And like, they find like all the fucking jargon written on Ew. huge sheets of paper. And it's like, how wild is that? That they were holding a fucking parent. No, it's called a seminar. Seminar. So, phwah. Uh, they found a business card left by Norm Tippolt, who was originally the therapist at Cross Creek. Litchfield's first uh, first one. Lots of weird connecting dots, you know, it's wild. So he then opened up a center called Three Point Center that works exclusively with adopted children. So Catherine calls like a brave ass, badass motherfucker to, you know, ask, just ask some questions. She says, you know, like, Kid's really a problem. I'm just afraid she won't go. And she goes, yeah, she doesn't have to choose to be with us. Don't worry, basically, because you can hire a transport company to take her if you can't, which means have them kidnapped in the middle of the night. And she goes, was she any chance like adopted through foster care? Because then if so, you get like a grant through the fucking state because we have an agreement with a lot of counties in California. What? That's right. They're not just working privately now. Now these fucking places have government fucking 
contracts. They go, yeah, your out of pocket will only be 200 bucks a month. Oh my God. All casually. And that was as of filming within the last year. Yeah. So, um, Yanya says that there are several hundred thousands of kids going through these programs at any time in a given year. It's a billion dollar industry in Utah alone. It's at half a billion dollars in year. Yeah, they're like the mecca for troubled teen industry places. Yeah. Yeah. There are over 100 TTI facilities in Utah (sighs) today. And it's a hot spot for wilderness programs, which are even cheaper to run because you just send your child to trek through the hot, barren desert for, you know, 90 days. And they don't really have to feed them because the kids can eat, you know, lizards and whatnot. And uh, they don't have to pay for accommodation because they're sleeping on the dirt. But I'm sure they're still charging the the parents like a thousand some dollars a month. Of course. <laughs> it's not like they're getting a discount for doing wilderness. It's just sold as a different oh, yeah. kind of thing. It's still the same price. It's just a more profitable model. Actually, you know, in one of my several stints in rehab, I met a girl who had been to wilderness. I just had no idea what the fuck that was oh, at wow. the time. But she told me that she got like sent to the middle of nowhere for months and she got some something bad happened medically like she broke an ankle or got a super infected blister or something and they're like yeah well that's how the cookie crumbles sometimes and like the medical neglect is rampant it's wild you know deaths occur it's so Unlike food in our country, there is no FDA for behavioral health. I can make up any kind of therapy and advertise it. I can advertise it and take however much of your money right. of, as I want. If if you give it to me, I can be like, Fallon, I can read your palm and tell you that you um, need more carrots in your diet and i have magical carrots from my garden that were grown with um the blood Mm -hmm. of christ and if you're like cool then we can just do that i mean but like let's talk about those carrots later after the show (laughs) i'm sorry carrots of uh blood of christ let me get him on that yeah um hit me up you guys (laughs) hit up my dms they're only one million (laughs) dollars (laughs) <laughs> okay all right let me wrap this bitch up so um in 2020 16 year old cornelius frederick was murdered by staff in a facility for the egregious crime of throwing a piece of bread they restrained him violently and multiple uh, staff for 12 minutes and you can tell that this was a regular occurrence because staff and other kids are sitting there eating their lunch they're walking by they're not phased by this they're not like oh my god stop you're killing him because they were killing him they got this on video i'm guessing just like on the oh this is on video yep you see it um that's why it's like the documentary is so good and it's so powerful and sometimes i think getting that impact that you're just like uh like it makes like anger can be very impactful and like rage can be fueling but also this is is just like a lot yeah. to take in when it's you're seeing all of it visually and and the reason that he was in a facility because you know like Catherine he was just like a terrible kid his mom died so he was put into state care which made him eligible for one of these programs so for zero reason basically Mm -hmm. because his mom died essentially like the other little Mm -hmm. girl who her dad dying was her fault and that's why she ended up in a place like that that is their mo at these places i don't know how the fuck you sleep at night when your job is to make children believe that they are worthless and to abuse them. 
So Ken K, our buddy, they find emails from him to other program directors ranting about the End Institutionalized Abuse Against Children Act of 2005. He's like, can you believe this bullshit? He says, quote, in an email, Utah has approximately 1,500 teens in private youth programs. That's pristine money coming into this little state. Those out-of-state dollars. Wow. That's how he refers to the children, as pristine out-of-state dollars. In this email, he's not saying like, well, all we would have to do is end all the abuse in our facilities, right? But he's saying like, no, 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 we absolutely need the abuse to run our facilities and they make us money that way. Yeah, so keep it up, motherfuckers. Basically, everybody is making a fuck ton of money off of the human trafficking of these kids. Luckily, social media is not all a garbage pit, you know, um, survivors have been using it to tell their stories and spread awareness. The survivors are obviously the fucking experts who need to be listened to here. They're the ones who have gone through this shit. They know what's going on. They know what needs to change, which needs to be that it gets shut the fuck down. But, you know, like knowledge is power. So everybody, you know, tell a friend and then like tell them why a compliment about why you like them just because you unsolicited yeah. bummed them out. Fallon, I like that you're such a reliable person. That's just one quality, but you know, you, that's hard to find out in these streets. So <laughs> thanks for that. I get out. <laughs> I trust that I can rely on you not to institutionalize me. And that feels I mean, I good. definitely would never institutionalize you. <laughs> Thank you. Anywho, so they are shutting some places down very much in thanks to organizations like Unsilenced, shout out Meg, Meg Applegate, founder of Unsilenced Now. Um, it's They are a nonprofit doing amazing work in the troubled teen industry. And some state investigations are happening, but it's not nearly no. fucking enough. Okay. It's just like, it's not more needs to be happening in light of all the evidence right. that's present. Like it's fucking so bananas that, but how, how is this still happening? But they're just really sneaky. They're really good at starting up in a new location with a new name, with the same employees and the same practices. And it's, uh, it's wild. The Litchfields are still making programs, just not under the WASP name. Narvin, who was going by Marvin Litchfield. Now it's Narvin. Mm -hmm. On socials. He blocked me, so I can't see anymore. But he is still operating. Of course he is. Like, I want to do things. I'm going to rain you. But I'm just going to keep telling this story. <laughs> so... While she's in Utah, Catherine and some of the other survivors, they see that he posts on his social media saying like, oh, I'm in a karaoke tonight. Come hang out. And she's like, oh, thanks, Marvin. Narvin, whatever you're going by. Yeah. Don't mind if we do. So they fucking show up and he obviously doesn't right. recognize them because they're just one of or a few of hundreds of thousands of kids, hundreds of thousands of kids that he's tortured and ruined the lives of, you know, but he's singing Frank Sinatra. And of course he is. She's just like, it's so surreal seeing this man up there singing Frank Sinatra. And then she doesn't want to blow her cover, which I think is amazing because I don't feel that I would be able to restrain myself from in the very least, violently, verbally assaulting these people. I also don't feel like we would be able to restrain yourself. <laughs> <laughs> like, hold me back, Fallon. Just kidding. Get the <laughs> fuck off. You know, it, like, I was so impressed with their restraint because I would be pulling a Nancy Kerrigan or, you know, Tanya Hart, whatever, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay stop. Fallon stop okay and then it's incredible because Catherine and a couple of the other girls get up and they sing one way 
or another. I'm going to find you. I'm going to get you, get you, get you, get you. It's poetic justice. And Catherine says, quote this, there's revenge I could do, but I'm not going to do it. I'm not being malicious. I'm setting the record straight. Who knows what will happen legally if any law enforcement will actually get their shit together or if they'll actually get punished. I'm not a law enforcement agent. Bitch, I'm not crying. You are. I'm just a kid trying to expose the truth. And it really just started out. It was just to show my dad because he didn't believe me. They didn't believe any of us. They didn't believe any of us about any of this. Ugh. She starts crying when she said it was just to show my dad because he didn't believe me to just like see the little yeah. girl come out and say this whole fucking 10 year investigation, this whole goddamn documentary. All of this is basically just to like get validation from yeah. my dad to like see me validate what I went through. Believe me. Heavy. Catherine's dad like sees her crime board and he says he's really proud of her and he asks if he can have her stand in front of it to take a picture like and then I'm fucking sobbing because it's like showing footage of her as a child and he's like being a really good dad he's like Catherine it's your birthday and like yeah that shit hit like super close to home as like somebody who was close to my dad as a kid and then that just like poof yeah. went away at like one point and i was just like that is. it's just like because i understand that feeling of like having been so fucking loved and protected mm -hmm. by that person at some point and then the ultimate betrayal of them just leaving you in the hands of horrible something untrustworthy people that you no idea what these at best unknown people are doing you know it's ugh. so it's funny because my friend trevin asked me he goes man you really love those troubled teens but it's i think it's because i just like i am i'm you know i see you survivors i'm a fucking troubled teen at heart so she shows him that in one of her journals the quote of the day was i love daddy and then you hear another thing. She's like, and I fucking hate you. It's obviously just like the hate is coming from a place of just like so much hurt of I love you so much. How the fuck right. did you do this to me? And he says he really didn't know what was going on. He assumed from the letters when she said that she wasn't allowed to talk that it meant in school or something, not 24 seven. She says that what she's realized a lot through all of this is how manipulated and lied to that he was. He says that it's really shaming to know that he was fooled by such idiots. They both agree like, yeah, these guys are idiots, but they're really good at fooling people. And, um, you know, he asks her what should be done instead. And she said, there's not a good answer for that. And like I said, in the last episode, they ask uh, a psychologist. I didn't get his name, but he was quoted a few times throughout the episode. But, you know, when parents ask him what they should do instead, he says, I don't know. I'm not that smart, but not this. Yep. Don't do this. <laughs> That's the only answer I really have for you. We hear from Maya Salovitz again. She said, you know, troubled teen isn't a diagnosis. Adolescence is a hard time. It's... The job of the adult to be like, okay, I get that. Right. That's a teenager. But breaking a child's sense of self makes it very hard for them to function when they return to the real world. Yanya said, when people get out of confinement, they go into survival mode. Surviving means not looking at that. And for Catherine, she said it was workaholism. And she said, but, you know, I, I just started having really bad PTSD. And Yanya says complex PTSD, CPTSD. And Catherine explains that one contributing factor to CPTSD is long-term abuse or trauma where the victim perceives little or no chance of escape. Yanya says that complex PTSD colors all of your relationships afterwards because of the mistrust and paranoia 
and fear and betrayals. You have flashbacks and nightmares, but you also have huge issues of trust, loss of sense of self, and not knowing how to relate to people. I love this documentary because it's like informing on so many things that are so important, just like even understanding complex PTSD, which is very kind of new to the public knowledge, I think. And unfortunately for a lot of the survivors, they won't go to therapy because they were abused right. in the name of therapy. A lot of suicides come out of these problems. Well, these programs, yeah. problems. One survivor describes not wanting to live many times from 2006 to 2020. He can't count the amount of people that he was in the program with that aren't here today. Catherine says that her and some of the other survivors have been keeping a list of people they knew, and it's at about 40 people who have overdosed or died by size Ugh. suicide in the decade since at least Catherine left. <sighs> and Yanya said that's one of the hardest parts of mm -hmm. being aware of this whole epidemic is knowing about the right. aftermath. Alexis plays Girls Just Want to Have Fun on the piano in the old gym and on the back it on the wall it says Robbers of Childhood and it's just fucking gnarly heartbreaking and it kind of ends with a quote from Maya Salovitz that says quote creative difficult Challenging teenagers are the ones most likely to become our artists, our writers, our social critics, and our scientists, and they're at risk in this climate. Tough love programs, no matter how well intended, often they may be, which I don't think they ever are, wind up destroying these kids in their attempts to save them. If there were good research that showed that such programs were effective, there might be an ethical dilemma over their use. But in the absence of such data and in the presence of much that suggests they produce damage, not improvement, we should stick with the first principle of medical ethics, which is first do no harm. And I would argue no that harm. we shouldn't even be considering it through a medical ethics lens. I would say that we should just recognize that they are unprofessionally unsanctioned programs that cause abuse, neglect, and death. The end. There shouldn't even be a debate. Like a lot of what she says, but also I don't think that these programs are ever well intended. I don't think their intent is ever to try to save kids, but there is tons of research that they produce a fuck ton of damage. And pretty much it. Yeah. The end. Well, okay. No, hold on. Here's, I promised you guys there was something good coming. Jacob Finlinson, who was the director of academ <laughs> academics at Ivy Ridge, was fired from his company on March 7th, <laughs> two days after yes. the documentary aired. Amazing. So, um, that's pretty dope. Also, Julie Pescahova, a former student, a uh, victim enrolled at Ivy Ridge in 2005, described Finlandson's being fired as a, quote, sense of justice. She said, the fact that two of the biggest abusers from Academy and Ivy Ridge have been fired from their jobs after just two days of the documentary release proves that the communities are outraged and refuse to let them get away with it even after all these years later, end quote. I don't know who the second person is. Amy. Amy. Amy Ritchie. Escorted from her job like two days ago. I thought you said that to me, but I couldn't find it anywhere yep. online. Where the fuck did you find that? I just looked it up yesterday. I looked up Amy Ritchie and it came up. Maybe it's been scrubbed. But yeah, Amy Ritchie, the program director at Ivy Ridge on the girls' side, was working at the Walt Disney Company and she apparently got fired. But I, I did look up today on the news and the good news is, is that there's a ton of both major and minor media outlets covering all of the problems that were listed by this documentary and like the outrage at people not knowing that they exist. And so it looks like there is like a bigger ripple effect than with other things that have come out about these industries. And I hope that everybody who's picking up on it and amplifying it will just like keep spreading it. I'm going to post something about it every day and hope that people share it. I'm just, yeah. Yeah. 
No, I mean, this is something that we have been focusing on for a long time here at TSFU because it needs to be so much more known about. I mean, literally Dr. Phil is doing this on television for entertainment. So highly recommend the documentary. If you can't do it, totally understandable. Self-care first, always. And to all of the victims of the program, all of them and the survivors, we fucking see you guys. We believe you. We champion you. Like we're, my heart is like broken for all of them. I'm going to go as soon as we're done here and hug my two babies (laughs) who will never go hug myself. Like experience this. I think I'm going to get a fro-yo. Go take care of little Ashley and get her a fro-yo. Yeah, she's like, oh, for you. All right, guys. Well, thanks for listening. Um, go listen to something positive. Go laugh at something. I don't know. Touch grass. Pick a flower. Call a friend. Watch a funny something. Go put on the office. Funny animal videos. That's what I'm gonna go do. Yeah, that's always <laughs> good. Sometimes though, those are too much for me. Like I'm like, that's too cute, and then it makes me want to cry more. So. <laughs> You know, just do what works for you guys. We love you and see you next time. Okay, bye. Okay, bye. Bum, 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 That's bum, fucked up. Oh, God, I'm so fucked up. Can't you see? It's just really fucked. That's fucked up.